Michael Charles Jones was a professional wrestler whose career spanned over four decades. Originally a bodybuilder, after receiving advice from Tony Atlas, Jones decided to try his luck in pro wrestling and began training under AFA of the Wild Samoans. Debuting in the mid-1980s as Soul Train Jones, he would soon make his way to the WWF and into his most well-known role as the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase's no-nonsense bodyguard Virgil. At the time along with DiBiase, he would be used in the backdrop of the company's most famous angles, including when Hulk Hogan was stripped of the title after holding it for four years. Virgil often acted as a shield for DiBiase, taking beatings from opponents while DiBiase escaped to safety. Primarily serving as a bodyguard and a manager, initially Virgil rarely competed in the ring, though he did occasionally participate in matches. Virgil, I think I'm beginning to perspire. In 1991, Virgil turned against DiBiase, defeating his former boss at both WrestleMania and SummerSlam that year. He broke away from DiBiase and would bounce from the mid to lower card as a singles performer. Jones found another prominent role in 1996 when he joined WCW as a member of the New World Order alongside DiBiase. In WCW, Jones took on the name Vincent, occasionally wrestling but primarily serving as a group's enforcer. Like most WWF stars from that era, Jones would eventually find greener pastures and a lighter schedule and more generous payouts in WCW. He would retire from in-ring competition in 2000 when WCW was bought out by the WWF and like most wrestlers, still made countless appearances in the independent circuit. Jones would gain internet fame when he would set up his merchandise table and appear as his Virgil character in virtually everywhere from parking lots to swap meets and even subway stations. Many would question if this was his Virgil character or the real Mike Jones. But who was the real Mike Jones? Who was he before he became the knockaround guy for Ted DiBiase? And what was his life really like after his TV fame came to an end? Well, this is the story of Mike Jones, aka Virgil. According to Wikipedia, Michael Jones was born in Pennsylvania on April 7, 1951 to Warren Jones Sr. and Elizabeth Jones. He had two older brothers, Warren Jr. and Donald, and a sister, Tony. Although most of his adult life he claimed he was born in 1961, shaving 10 years off his age. In an industry where in many cases, your value depends on how many miles you have left in the tank. Also according to Wikipedia, Jones attended Virginia Union University and played as defensive back for the college football team. He wrestled as an amateur and later worked at his uncle's loading and moving company and began entering bodybuilding competitions. After a chance meeting with Tony Atlas in a Pittsburgh gym, Atlas recommended Jones to try out pro wrestling in 1985. In the same year, he began training with AFA of the Wild Samoans. After extensive digging and down a few rabbit holes, I could not confirm or deny his athletic background or attendance at the Virginia Union University. On the contrary, in an article posted by SlamWrestling.net, Virgil did not wrestle at suburban Moorville High School and didn't compile a 32-0 record at 186 pounds. His father, Warren Jones Sr., who insisted that his children get straight A's, was not a Navy SEAL. However, his mother, Elizabeth, might have really worked in the office at a bus company. Brother Warren Jr. has passed away and brother Donald is reportedly in his 80s and in a nursing home or an assisted living facility and has never bench pressed 500 pounds no matter how much his baby brother pumped him up. Sister Antoinette Jones talks about her brother and lives in their hometown in Wilkinsburg. Rumor killer, Virgil never taught math or anything else as a high school teacher. But what is true is in the summer of 1987, 
When the Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase's vignettes began airing on WWF programming, Virgil was behind him playing an intricate part in DiBiase's character. And what else is true is at some point in Michael Jones' life, he made the decision to make bodybuilding a priority in his life, which undoubtedly contributed to his consistent participation in the top tier of the WWF until 1991. Jones began his professional wrestling career in 1985 under the name Soul Train Jones, competing in the Championship Wrestling Association based in Memphis, Tennessee. He quickly found himself in heated rivalries with Chick Donovan and Big Bubba. By 1986, he was already on the radar of the WWF, but they weren't quite sure what to do with him. In the meantime, the WWF would bring him in for house shows and preliminary matches where he would be known as Lucius Brown. Since the WWF didn't have a farm system, they would rely on plucking talent from smaller promotions. And because he wasn't quite ready for the big stage, the WWF would supplement his payouts by a few hundred dollars each week to keep his mind focused on his training and dedication to the business. At the same time, gaining experience and paying his dues in front of smaller audiences. On January 4th, 1987, he captured the AWA International Heavyweight Championship by defeating Big Bubba. His reign lasted 106 days until April 20th, when Donovan dethroned him. During his title run, Jones also entered a tournament for the vacant AWA Southern Heavyweight Championship, where he defeated Tommy Rich, The Hunter, and Goliath to reach the final, but ultimately lost to Austin Idol. Additionally, he challenged Nick Bockwinkel for the AWA World Heavyweight Championship, but was unsuccessful. Later, he teamed up with Rocky Johnson to win the AWA Southern Tag Team Championship, a title they held for 28 days before losing it to Donovan and Jack Hart. Ted DiBiase debuted in the WWF with his persona as the Million Dollar Man. This character was known for his arrogance, wealth, and lavish spending, portraying a villainous persona. DiBiase was famous for flaunting his money and tried to use it to gain advantages. In 1988, DiBiase manufactured a plan where he would pay off Andre the Giant to defeat Hogan for the belt and give it to the Million Dollar Man. At the time, this was one of the top angles of the 1980s, with the title being stripped from Hogan. This marked the end of an era, not only in the WWF, but culture in general. When turning on his boss led to a face turn for Virgil, this would culminate into a match at WrestleMania 7 in 1991, where Virgil defeated Ted DiBiase for the Million Dollar Championship, which was a significant moment in their storyline rivalry. Although at the time the feud between the former boss and the employee could potentially lead to a multi-year rivalry, Although he always kept himself in top physical condition, Virgil's in-ring skills were limited, requiring the Million Dollar Man to carry most of their matches. According to DiBiase, on his Everybody's Got a Pod channel on YouTube, when questioned about Virgil, he would answer. Well, you know, Virgil's a nice guy, but I guess the nicest way to say it is, he's just not real bright. If he would have, you know, had a little more savvy and a little more talent as a performer, I could have done a lot. Him playing that part of being my manservant and all that stuff for as long as he did. And then they did the turn and all of a sudden, you know, he's a big baby face and kicking my butt. That would have been great. But the simple facts are Virgil just didn't have the tools to get it done. He just didn't. Virgil would later befriend Roddy Piper and would act as Virgil's occasional tag team partner, manager and mentor. Piper's in-ring appearances were limited at this point and having Virgil take all the bumps and do all the in-ring work gave longevity to Piper's career and the company was able to keep him intertwined into its main storylines. Desperate to stay in the spotlight and most importantly employed, as a suggestion from Pat Patterson, he would even dress as a woman and for a short time be known as Virgil's sister, Virgilina. According to an interview with Virgil on WrestlingInc.com, he would state, The pipe was something else. He was such a good friend and he was such a great teacher. He was really a great person. Roderick Toombs, may God bless your soul, one of the best guys in the world. Although this partnership is often overlooked, 
It led to some of the more entertaining interviews at the time. Virgil would also become the only man at the time to be recognized as a million dollar champion other than DiBiase. The title would make a handful of comebacks throughout the years and held by half a dozen other stars, but Virgil will always be remembered as a man to dethrone Ted DiBiase from the very championship he created. But unfortunately, Virgil's quick rise to the top wouldn't last long. After beating DiBiase via a countout at WrestleMania 7 and pinning him at SummerSlam later that year, his career would slowly slide down from mid to lower card. Although he did wrestle Bret Hart for the WWF title in 1992, by 1993 he was used solely to put over newer talent and even lost to Johnny Polo in the opening match at an event in Ontario. The name Virgil was reportedly a nod to then NWA Booker Dusty Rhodes whose actual real first name was Virgil, rumored to be an idea of Bobby Heenan, though the claim has been disputed by Bruce Pritchard. Virgil would hold on to the million dollar belt for approximately three months. During his brief stint as million dollar champion, Mike Jones admitted in later years to partying with several women with the belt and nothing else on but the belt. Regardless of his new lifestyle as a champion, it wasn't the cause of his downfall. It was more like the lack of charisma and mic skills he displayed that apparently bored Vince McMahon, but everyone else seemed to think he did okay. Last match was in January 1994, losing against Yokozuna in Madison Square Garden. And that's when the WWF started clearing out its roster from all its talent from the 1980s and the company began going in an entirely different direction, which didn't include an arrogant millionaire or his former bodyguard. Also leaving, stars who felt they weren't being fairly financially compensated, which would create a flood of free agents and the deep pockets of world championship wrestling would gladly pay them as if they were worth their weight in gold. And with a guaranteed lighter travel schedule and more creative control, this was a no-brainer for stars who had been making other companies millions of dollars but not sharing in the fortune. A name very familiar to wrestling fans. Bring him out, Get him out. Teddy, where's Get Vincent? Get off me! Where's Vincent! Vincent. Because... Often portrayed as the NWO's lackey or enforcer, he was usually seen as the bodyguard or background character during NWO's infamous beatdowns and promos. This role became a defining part of his WCW persona. While not known for his in-ring work in WCW, he did have a few brief feuds and NWO became watered down. And bringing in stars who weren't former WWF big names, his spot in the upper mid card would also see a decline. And when DiBiase left the WCW due to creative differences, he would no longer have the million dollar man to attach his name to. Although he lost most of his matches, he added a layer of comedic relief which became more and more outlandish and at one time even expressing his hate for rap music alongside Kurt Hennig and the West Texas Rednecks and also changing his name to Curly Bill. This actually became one of the more popular storylines at the time. But as they say, all good things must come to an end and the NWO would gain more and more members and the faction would self-split into two different entities. Over time, as the NWO storyline became more convoluted, Vincent's role diminished. His character's decline was notable as he went from being a prominent part of one of wrestling's most infamous factions to becoming more of a background character, reflecting the larger issues within WCW's booking during that era. By 1999, both squads of the NWO shrunk as one member after another slowly left, over time ironically leaving only Vince as the sole member and the de facto last leader of the original NWO before the faction dissolved for good in October 1999. Eventually, World Championship Wrestling was sold to Vince McMahon and Virgil along with several other stars decided to let their contracts run out and sit at home and collect their paychecks. That would be the end of his full-time in-ring career. After WCW folded, Virgil's presence in mainstream wrestling greatly diminished. Instead of transitioning to WWE or to other major promotions, he began wrestling on the independent circuit. He made appearances at smaller events and wrestling conventions, often capitalizing on his fame from his time in both WWF and WCW. 
He had been known to make appearances at conventions and autograph signings, selling memorabilia to wrestling fans. In the mid-2010s, Virgil gained an unexpected form of notoriety on the internet. He became a subject of several memes, particularly focused on his reputation for appearing at conventions with few attendees or long lines for his autograph. The Lonely Virgil meme became a popular running joke in the wrestling community, showing Virgil sitting alone at tables with few fans seeking his signature. While some wrestlers might find this form of attention unwelcome, Virgil embraced it. He used the memes to his advantage, promoting himself and appearing on podcasts and shows to discuss his career, often playing into the comedic side of his later fame. Virgil made sporadic appearances in the wrestling world, including brief returns to the WWE for special segments. One of the more notable appearances was in 2010 when he reappeared in WWE as part of Ted DiBiase Jr.'s storyline, reprising his role as the elder DiBiase's bodyguard. His return, however, was short-lived and more of a nostalgic nod to wrestling fans than a significant return to action. In addition to his occasional wrestling appearances, he ventured into other forms of entertainment. He became active on platforms like Cameo, where he charged fans for personalized video messages, further capitalizing on his cult-like internet fame. In later years, Virgil faced personal and health challenges. He had been vocal about his struggles, including dealing with financial hardship and health issues. In 2022, he revealed that he had suffered multiple strokes and was dealing with early stages of dementia. His openness about his health had drawn sympathy from fans and colleagues, many of whom had contributed to fundraisers to help support his medical expenses. Though Virgil's post-WCW career hasn't been marked by major championship or high-profile matches, his legacy in wrestling remains unique. For many fans, he represents a cult figure of wrestling's past, a character who managed to stay relevant through a combination of nostalgia, self-promotion and humor. His embrace of internet fame and his willingness to engage with fans in unconventional ways has kept him a notable figure even if his in-ring career has long since ended. Okay. Virgil the meat sauce king, serving up heat from the ring to the streets, undefeated with beef. He used to roll with DBLs, he now run his own lane. Got that sauce game locked, yeah, bringing the flame. Million dollar dreams, now it's past the supreme. With a side of that sauce called Champions Cuisine. Pants know his hustle from the mat to the plate. Virgil serving up wins and spaghetti, that's great. And from the apron to the table, it's all about the grind. The meat sauce train, always one of a kind. Put the flavor in the mix like he did in the ring. For body slam, scarlet bread, he did everything. Catch him at the table or in the hall of fame with the signature sauce changing the game the signature ain't free it's all about the change keep the fuck money baby in the bread six at close range